Hello. Today we are going to have a look at Power Plus, the analog widescreen technology with the distinction of being even more obsolete than the one it was supposed to be enhancing. But of course that which is obsolete is just our kind of thing around here. Now for those with only a passing interest in this subject, this is going to be quite a lot to take in and I don't expect that you'll Sorry about that. Even I got distracted countless times in the making of this video, which is why it has taken me an entire year to get it out the door. So without further ado, let's finally dig in. So what is Pal Plus? Well, this is it right here. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I didn't think so. The problem Pal Plus is intended to solve was first encountered by the film industry when producers started to experiment with widescreen formats. The dominant film format at the time was called 4 perf or 4 perforations per frame, which has a similar aspect ratio to 4x3, but a little bit less rectangular. And most of the machinery for the recording and playback of film was geared around this format, but replacing it would have cost an absolute fortune. And the film industry is all about making money, not losing it. So instead, special lenses for cameras and projectors were developed to compress a picture of a different aspect ratio onto existing film stock. The television industry would eventually face the same problem during the inevitable transition to widescreen, but with an additional headache, which is that the viewing equipment belongs to the viewer and said viewer isn't going to go replacing it just because some content might be in a different aspect ratio. So let's take a minute to look at some actual scenarios here. Now I've got two different generators out here. We've got our Power Plus generator and an anamorphic generator, and they're both outputting fairly similar test cards, but not completely identical. So we're currently plugged into the anamorphic version and the TV is in this kind of full screen mode here. And this is what widescreen television would have looked like without Power Plus, this very tall stretched looking image, which I think probably wouldn't be acceptable to most people. An ideal scenario is that TVs would have a built-in letterboxing feature like this, so it would be possible to just crush down the image to the correct aspect ratio. And if this were, if this were the case, then there would have been no need for Power Plus whatsoever. But in reality, this, this sort of feature didn't really become common in televisions, probably more till the late 1990s. And Power Plus was introduced in the early 1990s. And even in the late 90s, it, it wasn't a given that people were going to go out and buy new TVs just because Power Plus may have been in use. So uh, let's uh, put the TV back to the full screen mode again and disconnect from the anamorphic generator and plug into the Power Plus generator. So we have uh, some letterboxing in the image even though the TV is in full screen mode. And if I actually go and press the letterboxing button, we can see that the image is actually crushed down even further and there's some kind of control signal or something visible here that shouldn't be. So this gives us a clue as to how Power Plus works in that the letterboxing is built into the signal. Now there is a question of well, what happened to all of that detail that's been taken out of it by letterboxing it. Well, it is hidden in the black bars up here. You can sort of see these little smudges of blue. As for how this actually works, well, there's actually quite a bit of theory to cover. First of all, let's have a look at the contents of a Power Plus signal. At the top of the frame, outside of the visible area, we have the widescreen signaling um, signal, and optionally the ghost cancellation reference. We'll talk a bit more about these later on. Next up we have the first half of the helper, which is 144 lines of invisible signal containing the information that was stripped out to create the visible letterboxed image. As for how they managed to make it invisible, once again, we'll cover that later on. And then we have the active signal, 432 lines of regular PAL video containing the letterboxed image. And then of course we have the other half of the helper. If we add 432 and 144 together, we get 576, the number of visible lines in a PAL video signal. If we divide 576 by 4, we get 144, and that gives us the first clue as to how this technology works. The visible letterbox image is basically three of every four lines of the original, but of course it is nowhere near that simple in practice. Let's imagine a simple encoding process where the lines are literally rearranged. Three lines go into the visible letterbox and one is hidden in the black bars and so on. This would kind of work, however the visible image would suffer from aliasing, a problem which arises when a screen is attempting to display an image which exceeds its resolution. 
To solve this problem, the source image has to be downscaled. A downscaling is literally a case of removing the highest frequency components of the signal with a low pass filter, but doing so would lose detail. Enter the QMF or quadrature mirror filter, a special type of filter which splits a signal in two by frequency domain without any loss of detail. From the low pass filter, we get the signal which goes into the visible area. And from the high pass filter, we get everything which was removed from the original. And while it contains the highest frequency components, the actual bandwidth is relatively low. And after further processing down to a baseband signal, it is eventually modulated into the invisible helper signal. Now this all having been said, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. Firstly, this process occurs not only horizontally, but also vertically, and this is why PAL Plus is so complicated. In order to filter vertically, the entire image has to be digitized into a frame buffer so that signal processors can filter the samples both vertically and horizontally. Thus, this is very much a digital process. And secondly, this process is only performed on the luminance. For chrominance, only a simple low pass filter at the horizontal level is required. And because there is so much less chrominance information anyway, aliasing just isn't really a problem. And therefore, the complicated scaling process used for luminance is unnecessary. The job of the PAL plus decoder quite simply is to reverse this process. And once again, it is a complicated, entirely digital process whose input and output happens to be an analog video signal. Now the elephant in the room. How does PAL plus hide picture detail in plain sight? To explain this, we're going to grab the oscilloscope. At present, we're flipping through the last few visible lines, and eventually we arrive on the first lines containing the helper signal. And straight away, we can see that the helper signal is weird. It doesn't look anything like the visible lines. And remember that in a regular PAL video signal, luminance is represented by DC voltage, and the chrominance is represented by a modulated AC signal, the color subcarrier. What we are looking at here is the color subcarrier being misused to carry luminance information. It's AM modulated luminance pretending to be chrominance with a luminance of zero. Got it? And therefore, it should be invisible, but inevitably, some receivers will end up displaying patches of dark blue in areas occupied by the helper signal. And presumably, blue was chosen because it is less visible to the human eye. PAL Plus had two modes of operation, camera mode and film mode. I find the term camera kind of confusing. I think referring to it as 50Hz interlaced mode makes more sense, but there is a good reason why it is called camera mode, because such a source will almost certainly have come from an electronic video camera. In this mode, all of the PAL Plus processing we have just covered is performed on a field by field basis. All of the odd lines and then all of the even lines. And no information is exchanged between the two. It is effectively the normal operating mode for PAL Plus. Film mode, on the other hand, is very different. Before we can talk about film mode, we must first talk about actual film, specifically the telecine, the equipment that is used to play film on television. Wherever you are in the world, film is most likely to have been shot at 24 frames per second, whereas television systems are either 25 or very nearly 30 frames per second for PAL and NTSC respectively. For the NTSC telecine, this difference in frame rate is a major headache. But for the PAL telecine, life is easy. The film is simply played a tad faster at 25 frames per second. There are a number of drawbacks of this technique, however, it is off topic for this video. The key thing we need to know here is that a PAL telecine will scan each frame of the film twice, once for the odd field and once for the even field, resulting in the required 50 Hz output. That is the central assumption of PAL plus film mode, that each field of the interlaced video signal comes from exactly the same image. In this mode, a PAL plus encoder uses a slightly different filter characteristic, optimized for the lower frame rate, but I'm not going to go into detail about it because it's not really all that important and we have so many other things to cover. The main enhancements of film mode were actually done at the receiver. In the case of a television with a 100Hz interlaced or 50Hz progressive scan display, the image can be deinterlaced without any risk of motion artifacts. But in the case of a 50Hz interlaced display, we definitely don't want to do this. And let me take a minute to explain why. If we deinterlace 576 visible lines of signal, 
we potentially end up with 576 lines of detail, which we definitely do not want on an interlaced display. This test pattern here, incidentally one that is generated by the PowerPlus generator, has just that. Uh, pay attention to the right hand side. Each individual line alternates between black and white. Uh, let's take a minute to think about what that might look like on an interlaced display, given that it will render all of the black lines in one pass and then all of the white lines in another pass. Yeah, kind of nasty. So what is a 50 hertz interlaced TV to do then? Well, I had to do a bit of digging here, but the answer appears to be that it will deinterlace the central 432 line image, stretch it to full screen, and then throw away the detail and the helper signals. And it works out that three quarters of the detail is just about the most that an interlaced screen can display without the risk of the unsightly flashy aliasing that we have just seen. Next up, Color Plus. I assume viewers are familiar with S-Video, where luminance and chrominance are separated. If not, I tried my best to explain it back in video number 9. It's not a perfect analogy, but Color Plus is an optional feature of Power Plus which attempts to do the same over the airwaves. Precisely how it works and how well it works depends on whether the system is in camera mode or film mode. First off, we'll start with film mode because this is where Color Plus was at its best. Remember that in film mode, each field of the source signal comes from exactly the same image. In this mode, adjacent lines from each odd and even field will contain exactly the same chrominance information, but with the phase inverted. Because of this, there are some tricks that we can deploy to help separate the signals. But first of all, let's also consider what the Power Plus encoder is doing here. The input signal for each adjacent odd and even line is passed through a QMS filter. Detail represented by frequencies below 3 MHz are simply passed on to the transmitter exactly as before, because they would never get mixed up with chrominance anyway. For details represented by frequencies above 3 MHz, the luminance detail between each adjacent odd and even line is summed at the encoder, so now each odd and even line of the luminance contains exactly the same high frequency content while still containing independent low frequency content. Now for the magic. First of all, a PowerPlus decoder will run the signal through another QMF filter. This time, the low frequency component of the signal is sent directly to the display, but the high frequency component is put aside for color plus processing. To derive the luminance, the chrominance and high frequency luminance component of each adjacent odd and even line is added together. To derive chrominance, it is simply a case of subtracting them from each other. So that is film mode color plus. What about camera mode? In this scenario, the encoder continuously compares the chrominance information of each adjacent odd and even line. Where it matches, the same technique used in film mode applies. But where there is no match, when the image has changed between fields, for example, the encoder simply filters out any luminance detail above 3 MHz, leaving the decoder with no color plus to decode, and the display with no possibility of luminance and chrominance crosstalk. There are lots more details in practice, but you get the idea. Now a couple of miscellaneous features which were introduced with Power Plus but can be and were used independently of it. The first is the widescreen signal, a digital header transmitted on line 23 which provides aspect ratio and other transmission configuration information to the receiver. Let's have a look at it on the oscilloscope. As I flip through the various modes we can see the individual bits changing. You may recall your TV automatically switching between a 4x3 and widescreen depending on the content. This was the work of the widescreen signal and it's actually more likely that it was being used on an anamorphic transmission as PowerPlus itself wasn't particularly common. An equivalent of this signal also exists for NTSC by the way. The other special signal introduced with Power Plus is the Ghost Cancellation Reference, or GCR, which is transmitted on line 318, also outside of the visible area. What we're looking at here is a sweep of the entire spectrum of a power video signal from very nearly DC to about 5 MHz. In some circles, a signal like this is referred to as a chirp, a type of signal commonly used by radars. This signal doesn't do anything by itself, however, a GCR-capable receiver knows exactly what it is supposed to look like, and by comparing it against a reference, we can actually work out the profile of any reflected signal in the transmission and eliminate it, effectively the opposite of a radar. 
So now that we have a pretty good understanding of how this technology worked, let's talk about its decline because as I hinted in the introduction, for the most part it didn't even manage to survive to the worldwide switch off of analog television. As much as Power Plus was a well designed and innovative system which probably just about managed to make up for its own shortcomings, it was also a very complicated system which solved a problem that only existed for a limited time, which of course was that lack of built in letterboxing in 4x3 televisions. Eventually this feature became standard on consumer sets and it worked out significantly cheaper and cleaner to have receivers handle widescreen scaling and with Power Plus eventually done away with, TV manufacturers were no longer constrained by its limitations, allowing for innovation in the handling of differing aspect ratios and inevitably better results. The other big problem for Power Plus is that adoption was not universal in the power world. In the United Kingdom, which was one of the biggest 625 line power markets, reception of Power Plus was at best frosty. Channel 4 occasionally used it and the BBC experimented with it in overnight test transmissions but ran into too many technical problems. One I have seen mentioned is the impact of the helper signal on transmitters. Recall that in all power transmission systems, the transmitter is at its peak power when the DC level of the transmitted signal is at its lowest, and unfortunately that power plus helper signal spends quite a lot of time below the black level, which at the very least would have meant that the transmitters would have run hotter and consumed significantly more electricity. Another finding is that so-called deep letterboxing was really unpopular with the British viewing public. Many regarded it as a detriment to the viewing experience, and instead they preferred 14 by 9 letterboxing without Power Plus as a compromise. Now it is time for a look inside some actual equipment, and you might be interested to know what is inside the Power Plus generator. Well, I actually showed it in the previous video. Basically, it's just a DAC hanging off a very large bank of EEPROMs, which contain computer generated samples. So there's no Power Plus encoder in there, unfortunately. I did try to find a Power Plus encoder for this video. I'm told by an industry contact that they were only made by Grundig, but unfortunately that information didn't really lead me to one. I can't even find any mention of one anywhere on the internet, let alone an actual example of one, unfortunately. Now this uh, decoder unit here, which says uh, Philips on the front panel, uh, I've seen these with other brands like Grundig and um, Sony and possibly others. I, I would imagine there's one with a Nokia branding as well. I, I couldn't find a, a manual for it, but it has four, four SCART connectors on the back, which seems a bit, a bit excessive really. They're all individually labeled, so this one says AV out, this one says decoder, this one says TV, this one says VCR. Now these two here, the VCR and decoder, I'm not sure what these are for. They head into an AV switch chip, which is um, just in the back of the PCB there, so there's some kind of switching scenario that goes on here, but I just, I don't know what it is. The connectors which seem to do do stuff in my experimentation is this one here, labeled TV, which has the Power Plus composite input and a decoded composite output. So presumably this connects to a TV which supports an external decoder, so the decoder would be using the tuner inside of the TV, decoding it, and then sending it back all in one cable, which is pretty cool. That's something that SCART can do. It's a pretty rare, pretty rare scenario, but it definitely is a possibility. This one here is has an S video output on it. And that's how I would normally use it. So I would send the Power Plus in here and then I would take an S-Video output from there. The architecture of this thing is, I guess as you would expect, the composite input goes into these two Philips chips here, which are just a analog video decoder. The output of those is a digital RGB, which goes into this big Nokia ASIC here. Now, in the opening scene of this video, I showed that Nokia TV and Nokia were a, it's, they seem to be the, the, the party that's done the really sort of nitty gritty R&D for Power Plus because their name appears on the clever stuff, so this ASIC. And also this, uh, I think this is a Mask ROM microcontroller, which is, which is driving this thing. Um, the output of this thing is digital RGB and it heads into this Philips chip again and this is basically the opposite of this here. So this is an RGB to analog encoder and it has two outputs. So composite output which would be heading to this SCART connector and the S-Video output which is heading to this here and presumably into these switches and through these other SCART sockets somehow or other. I don't really know how. Other interesting things on this board here is some SRAMs, so the 
uh, this decoding chip must be storing things, and, and we, we, I guess, throughout this video, we've sort of seen the need for, the, you know, to, for storage. So that's that's what these chips are here are going to be doing. Uh, other thing in here is this this cable. At one point in time, the power supply for this was dead, so I was running it off an external five and twelve volt. But uh, I have since repaired it. But I left the cable there just in case I ever need it again. There is a really, to me, a fundamental problem with this whole setup, uh, and that's really that what you're doing here is you're taking an analog video signal, you're turning it into a digital signal, mucking around with it a whole lot, and then you're turning it back into an analog signal again. Now, the Power Plus technology on paper is very nice, it's a very elaborate system which in theory should really not degrade the signal very much at all. But in practice, when we actually look at the implementation of it, particularly a decoder like this, Actually, the, the, there is quite a lot of detriments to the signal, and certainly I've noticed that what what goes in here is is um, a lot cleaner than what comes out. You know, and that's that's despite the fact that this is recovering, um, the, you know, a quarter of the the vertical resolution. The horizontal there is a loss of horizontal resolution in that process, which is a bit of a, a bit of a shame, really. And I have no doubt that in in later Power Plus decoders, there this would this would have been improved. These chips here are quite early, and you know, in, in more modern televisions, the the ability to decode composite video signals um, is is significantly improved. And there's actually another way that this could be improved as well, which is that rather than going back to digital in this process here, actually we just take the output of this and just go straight into the display. And I presume this is probably what the small number of LCD flat panel televisions which supported Power Plus did, but I don't know for sure. But to my mind that would be far nicer than this this kind of messy back to analog and then possibly then back to digital inside the TV again kind of process. Well that is all for this video and I hope you have learned at least something today. One of the criticisms I get with this channel is that I spend far too much time rabbiting on about technology which has absolutely no practical application anymore. And look, I get it. Power Plus is not something that anybody is going to be using for anything anymore. But the thing that we have to bear in mind is that a lot of engineering effort went into it, and it did solve a problem for a period of time, and for the most part, people were reasonably happy with it. So for that reason, I think it is worth at least attempting to remember it. But anyway, that is all for now, so thanks for watching.